A Man Who Had No Eyes by McKinley Cantor. A beggar was coming down the avenue just as Mr. Parsons emerged from his hotel. He was a blind beggar, carrying the traditional battered cane and thumping his way before him with cautious, half-furtive effort of the sightless. He was shaggy, thick-necked fellow. His coat was greasy above the labels and pockets, and his hands splayed over the cane's crook with a fertile sort of clinging. He wore a black pouch slung over his shoulder. Apparently, he had something to sell. The air was rich with spring. Sun was warm and yellowed on the asphalt. Mr. Parsons, standing there in front of his hotel and nodding the clack-clack approach of the sightless man, felt a sudden and foolish sort of pity for all blind creatures. And though Mr. Parsons, he was glad to be alive. A few years ago, he had been a little more than a skilled laborer. Now he was successful, respected, admired. Insurance, and he had done it alone, unaided struggling beneath handicaps. And he was still young. The blue air of spring, fresh from its memories of windy pools and lush shrubbery, could thrill him with eagerness. Cigarette lighters for sale. Mr. Parsons took a step forward just as the tap-tap-tapping blind man passed him by. Quickly, the shabby fellow turned. Listen, Governor, just a minute of your time, Mr. Parsons said. It's late. I have an appointment. Do you want me to give you something? I ain't no beggar, Governor. You bet I ain't. I got a handy little article here. He fumbled until he could press a small object into Mr. Parsons' hand. That I sell, one buck. Best cigarette lighter made. Mr. Parsons stood there, somewhat annoyed and embarrassed. He was a handsome figure with his immaculate gray suit and gray hat and malacca stick. Of course, the man with the cigarette lighters could not see him. But I don't smoke, he said. Listen, I bet you know plenty of people who smoke. Nice little present, wielded the man. And mister, you wouldn't mind helping a poor guy out? He slung to Mr. Parsons' sleeve. Mr. Parsons sighed and felt in his vest pocket. He brought out two half dollars and pressed them into the man's hand. Certainly I'll help you out. As you say, I can give it to someone. Maybe the elevator boy would. He hesitated, not wishing to be boorish and inquisitive, even with a blind peddler. Have you lost your sight entirely? A chemical explosion disaster. The shabby man pocketed the two half dollars. Fourteen years, Governor. Then he added with an instant sort of pride. Westbury, sir. I was one of them. Westbury, repeated Mr. Parsons. Ah, yes, the chemical explosion. The papers haven't mentioned it for years, but at the time it was supposed to be one of the greatest disasters in. They've all forgotten about it. The fellow shifted his feet wearily. I tell you, Governor, a man who was in it, don't forget about it. Last thing I ever saw was sea shop going up in one grand smudge and gas pouring in all the busted windows. Mr. Parsons coughed, but the blind peddler was caught up with the train of his one dramatic reminiscence. And also, he was thinking that there might be more half dollars in Mr. Parsons' pocket. Just think about it, Governor. There was 108 people killed, about 200 injured, and over 50 of them lost their eyes, blind as bats. He groped forward until his dirty hand rested against Mr. Parsons' coat. I tell you, sir, there wasn't nothing worse than that in the war, okay? I would have been well took care of, but I was just a workman working for what was in it, and I got it. You're so right, I got it. While the capitalists were making their dough, they was insured. Don't worry about that. They insured, repeated his listener. Yes. That's what I sell, blinded by the accident. You want to know how I lost my eyes, cried the man. Well, here it is. His words fell with the bitter and studied drama of a story often told and told for money. I was there in sea shop, last of all the folks rushing out. Out of the air there was a chance, even with the building exploding, right and left. A lot of guys made it safe out the door and got away. And just when I was about there, crawling along between those big vats, a guy behind me grabs my leg. He says, let me past you. Maybe he was nuts. I don't know. 
I try to forgive him in my heart, governor, but he was bigger than me. He hauls me back and climbs right over me, tramples me into the dirt, and he gets out. And I lie there with all that poison gas pouring down on all sides of me and flame and stuff. He swallowed a studied sob and stood dumbly expectant. He could imagine the next words. Tough luck, my man, awfully tough. Now I want to. That's the story, governor. The spring wind shrilled past them, damp and quivering. An unexpected twist. Not quite, said Mr. Parsons. The blind peddler shivered crazily. Not quite? What do you mean? The story is true, Mr. Parsons said, except that it was the other way around. Other way around? He croaked amatably. Say, governor. I was in sea shop, said Mr. Parsons. It was the other way around. You were the fellow who hauled back on me and climbed over me. You were bigger than me, Mark Wart. The blind man stood for a long time, swallowing horselessly. He gulped. Parsons, I thought you... And then he screamed fiendishly. Yes, maybe so, maybe so. But I'm blind, I'm blind. And you've been standing here letting me spout you and laughing at me every minute. I'm blind. People in the street turned to stare at him. You got away, but I'm blind. Do you hear? I'm... Well, said Mr. Parsons, don't make such a row about it, Mark Wart. So am I. I'm going to go through the questions now. They are very straightforward and shouldn't be too difficult to answer, so I won't spend a ton of time uh, going through them, but hopefully I answer any additional questions that you may have as I briefly discuss them. So question number one, what is the main problem Mr. Parsons faces? Why is this challenging for him? So both characters in the story face obviously an obstacle, uh, but then Mr. Parsons also faces some other challenges as we move forward into the story, um, just about how he treats people and how he sees others. So I want you to comment on that. Number two, what does Mr. Parsons now do for work? What did he do for work before? Explain. Number three, how has Mr. Parsons' experiences affected the way he looks at beggars? So Mr. Parsons is a very hardworking man right now. He doesn't, um, he doesn't really feel sorry for people that have kind of come upon hard ground if they didn't work for it or put in the effort because Mr. Parsons came from very little and he worked himself up to be a very successful businessman. So I want you to comment on that. Number four, why does the beggar tell people the version of the story that he did? Explain. So the beggar, essentially tells a lie. He's been telling people uh, a story that is somewhat true, but also majority of it is, is a lie and is pushing the truth. So why do you think he tells this story instead of the actual truth of what happens to him? Number five, what is the main difference between Mr. Parsons and the beggar? So I did actually just uh, touch on that about how Mr. Parsons was a very successful businessman, but he did have to work from the ground up. He did work very hard to get to where he was. Uh, and then obviously the beggar has had some bad luck in his life and maybe hasn't worked as hard as Mr. Parsons. So comment on both of those characters. Number six, what is the mood of the story at the beginning? Number seven, what is the mood at the end? So you will see the mood at the beginning of the story does uh, seem a little bit more upbeat. Uh, we talk about a successful businessman running into um, a person, a beggar, who's maybe down on his luck. Uh, but then by the end of the story, it is, it is a little bit uneasy. We're, we're left with a sense of unsure. Um, we don't really know what to believe um, because now we no longer believe the beggar's story. So I want you to comment on the mood at the beginning and then the mood at the end. So how do you feel as though the two have, have changed over the course of the story? Number eight. What seems to be the main theme of this story? And then explain. So what is the main idea that is happening in this story? Number nine, why doesn't the author tell the story from the time the men first met until now? So the author, um, he, kind of, he kind of leaves a lot of the story out uh, when he starts his, his story at the beginning. Why doesn't the author explain what happened to the men from the very beginning? Why does he only comment on that 
uh, later on in the story. So what suspense or what action, uh, what does it entice and make the reader feel? And you can comment on that. And then number 10 is a very personal question. There's no right or wrong answer. I just want you to answer honestly. What did you think of this story? Did you like it? Yes or no? Why or why not? Uh, if you maybe didn't like it that much, what could have made this story better? So what do you think the author could have done uh, to make this story more appealing to you? Anything you want to tell me would be awesome for that. Good luck on the questions.